Falcon Heavy STP2 launch summary. My name is Felix and today I'm going to show you why last night's Falcon Heavy STP2 launch is to be considered the most difficult launch SpaceX has ever done in its history. Join me for the next 10 minutes for this incredible ride to the very limits of what's possible with modern orbital rockets. If you're at all interested in SpaceX, and my wild guess is you are if you're watching this channel, stay with me on this one. It's definitely worth it. So, to start off this beautiful sequence of perfectly executed events, let's start with some beauty shots from right before the launch. The air was so still at historic Pet 39A that the vapor created by the extremely cold rocket stayed right where it was. It looked spectacular as the rocket was standing on the mound waiting for onboard computers to light the candle. Then, with precise timing, the huge rocket took off once again. What you can see in this picture are 27 Merlin 1D engines putting out 5 million pounds of thrust as it raced through the lower atmosphere towards space. Fun fact, that's two thirds of what Saturn V was able to put out with its F1 engines, so that's a very powerful rocket. Against what Falcon 9 does, Falcon Heavy has a roll program to orient itself after launch to its correct trajectory. Also, on this flight, Falcon Heavy turned off one engine on each side booster to minimize load on the rocket's structure. To my knowledge, that was a first. Then came the booster separation, which almost looked like a routine operation. It's incredible how well SpaceX does this all the time, considering that they're still the only company in the world to do it at all. Look at these side booster plumes. It's amazing to see how they interact with each other and the less and less dense atmosphere around them. A quick re-entry burn to shed some velocity, also done just perfectly. By the way, these boosters do this completely on their own. There's no one on the ground telling them what to do and when. Then came the coasting back to the LZ filmed with night vision cameras. You can see the grid fins controlling the descent very nicely. Measuring direction, velocity and pressure constantly, they work like the tail feathers of a bird, correcting the flight path many times each second. Then came what always impresses me the most about Falcon rockets. The one thing no one else can do with an orbital class rocket until today the landing and nailed it again. Meanwhile, the center core was busy plowing through the atmosphere at high speed. At this point of the mission, it was literally tortured. It had to endure more heat and dynamic pressure than any other Falcon 9 or heavy booster before. The second stage had to be higher and faster than other Falcon heavy flights in order to have enough performance in it to execute four burns into all the different orbits it would go to. Entry heating goes up by velocity cubed, not squared, so the core had to endure a lot more heat. After the execution of the re-entry burn, the core still had 20% more speed than the core from the Arabsat Falcon Heavy launch. SpaceX tried a three-engine landing burn to cope with this, without success. According to Elon, high entry force and heat breached the engine bay and the center engine's thrust vector control failed. The center core had a rapidly unscheduled disassembly next to Of Course I Still Love You. And what a beautiful shot it was. The rocket tilted 90 degrees sideways and shot off into the distance only to crash into the water a second later. Before the launch, Elon said that he'd give the core a 50-50 chance. Better luck next time. After the crash, he tweeted about the RUD immediately. Well, at least they won't have to refurbish the drone ship. Julia Bergeron, meanwhile, took a beautiful picture of the launch and landings. Thank you, Julia, for taking all these beautiful pictures. Now stay with me. This is where the marathon started that made this mission special. Normally, the launch is the most interesting part of a mission. Not this time, though. What SpaceX did from here on can only be described as mind-blowing. The first payload to part way was Oculus ASR by students from the Michigan Technological University. Due to the second stage traveling over Bermuda at the time, they lost contact to the ground station and coverage. Sadly, there was no picture of the Oculus deployment. Then came a 30-minute phase to deploy 8 P-Pods with a total of 11 satellites in it. The first P-Pod was still not covered as the signal was not reacquired yet. The second CubeSat was FalconSat 7, an optical telescope to take images of the Sun for the United States Air Force Academy. It was not on camera as it was on the other side of the dispenser. In each of the deployers there is a spring that pushes the P-Pod out with the payload inside. Next up with number 3 and 4 were PSAT, an amateur communication satellite, and BRICSAT, a micro propulsion system to perform experiments with attitude control, both from the US Naval Academy. 
don't forget, while these separations were happening, the upper stage had to constantly change direction to do the precise insertions. Next up on the never-ending list were two payloads from NASA's Enhanced Tandem Beacon Experiment built by the University of Michigan. That, by the way, was the last peapod on the side away from the camera. It was still visible though in the upper right corner of the picture. The two satellites explore bubbles in the electrically charged upper layer of Earth atmosphere. These bubbles can disrupt communication and GPS signals. They currently appear and evolve unpredictably and are difficult to be characterized from the ground. The two satellites are working to understand the problem and find ways to work around it. The upper stage was already over the east coast of Africa at this point. Next up, halfway between Africa and Australia, we had NASA LEO CubeSat and Stangsat CubeSat, which is a collaboration between PolySat at Cal Poly and the Merritt Island High School and is sponsored by the NASA Launch Services Program. The combined mission measured and recorded temperature and acceleration telemetry data from within the peapod during the launch. Next up was a 22 second second stage engine ignition to change orbit above the Pacific Ocean. The orbital insertion went well and the marathon continued. Soon after, on the ground, the impossible happened. Mystery captured one of the two payload fairing halves and the other one was spotted in the water. A first for SpaceX and their fleet. This will save quite a bit of money for the next launch, making it even cheaper for SpaceX to launch rockets into space. If a payload fairing does not touch the highly corrosive salt water of the ocean, refurbishment is much cheaper and quicker. Next up was Prox-1 Microsat by students at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. It demonstrates satellite close proximity operations. It was separated while coverage was lost, so there's no video. Fun fact, in a rendezvous it will do formation flights with Planetary Society's LightSail 2. LightSail 2 will unfold seven days into the future of the launch. Its mylar sail with 1 20th of the thickness of a sheet of paper will unfold to an area of 344 square feet. This is the largest solar sail ever demonstrated. Next up was NPSAT by the Naval Postgraduate Research Laboratory investigating the concentration of electrons in the ionosphere and researching survivability of electronics in space. Also, it's demonstrating a new type of solar sail. Next, General Atomics Electromagnetic System Orbital Testbed, or OTB. It's a modular platform to test and qualify technologies. OTB is hosting several payloads for technology demonstration purposes, including the Deep Space Atomic Clock by NASA's JPL to revolutionize how spacecrafts navigate. It's the first ever flown iron clock based on the mercury iron and it's just very accurate. Fun fact, it loses only one second in nine million years. That basically means it would have lost half a second since humanity came into existence. Pretty darn good. It's more than 50 times more accurate than currently used clocks on GPS satellites. The toaster-sized satellite will be tested in orbit for one year to see if the clock is stable in space. Then came GPIM or Green Propellant Infusion Mission, one of my favorites. I did an episode about that, so go check it out. It's basically a greener propellant that's more dense than traditional satellite and rocket propellants. A lot less toxic than the currently used hydrazine. NASA is pitching in to get the initial testing done, so companies can actually start using it for regular flights. And against expectations, we were able to see the separation. There it goes. Next up was the deployment of six COSMIC-2 satellites. COSMIC-2 is a partnership between the US National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, the United States Air Force, the JPL, Taiwan's National Space Organization, the UK Surrey Satellite Technology Limited, the Brazil Institute of Space Research, and Australia Bureau of Meteorology. That was difficult. The constellation will provide next-level satellite navigational radio oculation data. It's measuring data being refracted in the atmosphere. Basically, radio waves going from space through the atmosphere and back into space and how that changes the radio signals. This gives back data about temperature and moisture of the atmosphere the signal passed through. 
This is used to predict hurricanes and give more accurate trends about global temperature. Now for this, the second stage had to use cold nitrogen gas thrusters to rotate along its horizontal axis to orient itself for each separation. It basically did a little waltz in space. First was Cosmic 2-5. Cosmic 2-6 and 2-2 were not visible again due to camera placement. They deployed just fine though while the upper stage rotated. Cosmic 2-4 was again visible. Another flawless separation. I lost count of the operations at this point. How many successful separations did we have so far? Next up was Cosmic 2-1, another satellite hidden from view on the other side of the dispenser. Then came Cosmic 2-3 and guess what? Successful deployment. Who would have thought? That makes 6 out of 6 for the Cosmic Satellite team. So that was 23 satellites. Are you still with me? There was one more with a couple of orbit insertion burns for the upper stage to perform. And guess what? The engine ignited again. This was a 30 second burn above the equator to increase the orbit inclination and change the apogee from 700 to 6000 kilometers. Next was the fourth and final relight of the second stage engine, which was the most ever relights in a single mission in SpaceX's history. It was a 30 second burn and was executed perfectly again. Last but not least came the separation for the Air Force. The Demonstration and Science Experiment, or DSX, will conduct basic research on the harsh radiation environment of the medium Earth orbit. DSX is specially hardened against the radiation in MEO. DSX is also measuring the impact of solar activity on space hardware. It is no larger than a station wagon, but it will deploy booms over 260 feet. Fun fact, that is 15% larger than the Falcon Heavy that carried it into orbit. It's the largest spacecraft ever launched by SpaceX almost as long as the ISS. So that was it. 24 out of 24 for Team SpaceX. One of the most incredible missions SpaceX has ever done. Falcon Heavy keeps impressing and if this didn't certify the Heavy Falcon for the DoD, I don't know what will. This flight broke all sorts of records. Most relights of the upper stage, furthest downrange landing attempt. First fairing court, 24 satellites separated, one being the largest SpaceX ever launched. And hopefully the successful certification for the Department of Defense. This is just incredible. In my opinion, Falcon Heavy is the king of all the orbital rockets in operation right now. Well done, SpaceX. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It. I know it was just one topic, but what a topic it was. How did you like the launch? Tell me in the comments. Today, I also want to welcome James Jackson and Rob Collins as new supporters on Patreon. Thank you for joining the cause and all the incredible support. Thank you for watching this episode of What About It. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe and like because this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in making more and better content. This gives me more time to focus on what I love doing the most, to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. It's my last sale with the sickness, with the sickness. It's my last sale with one twentieth of the thickness of a piece of sh shit. <laughs> It's my last sale with one twentieth of the thickness of a piece of shit. Shit. Whoo.